All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Lillian Ash Baker. I'm a product security engineer at the Boeing Company in Whisk Aero. Today, I'll be discussing the most important part of aviation systems development, standards and certification. But what you, I hope you get out of this is an understanding of how the industry has developed safe systems and considers security in those designs. First, we need to discuss the safety uh, of these systems, and I'll make you all aware of what safe actually means in the aerospace industry. I hope you find this as interesting as I have. I still can't shut up about it 15 years later. So the first principles of safety that we have to talk about are failure conditions and probabilities, right? All of this information comes out of advisory circular 25 or 23, if you go re for the pilots in the crowd, that's part of the CFRs out there that uh, you're legally supposed to know. Uh, so advisory circular 25, 1309-1A, this is all public information actually lays out all these probabilities and kind of puts together this really nice graph of probability versus consequence, right? So you have probable, improbable, and extremely improbable, as well as an acceptability of those failures and faults. And there's a line that runs right between it that says acceptable and unacceptable, right? So you have to develop the system in order to understand what the system effects are gonna be of that. So as we move forward, those probabilities, those failure classifications actually have probabilities behind them as defined in the advisory circulars, right? So when we talk about safety, we talk about the probabilities of failure. So for a minor classification, that's a probable failure condition on the order of 10 to the minus fifth. Major is 10 to the minus ninth. That got reclassified as 10 to the seventh. Uh, Hazardous is 10 to the, um, now 10 to the seventh. Catastrophic is 10 to the ninth or less. So that means that like probabilities of 10 to the ninth. So think about the systems that you currently see in like IT and how often they have to stay up and operate. Our stuff has to operate and not fail. So the design assurance levels are a major component of how we develop these systems, right? So what you have are a nice trace of failure conditions with the severities, with the actual definitions of what that is, extremely probable, extremely remote, and the probabilities themselves that tie off to the functional DAL assignments. So whenever you're talking about aviation systems, if you see something that says that it is a DAL C system, this is what it means. It means that that system has a major effect on the system operation of the aircraft, has a remote possibility of failure, and has a, uh, a failure probability of somewhere between 10 to the fifth to 10 to the seventh uh, probability. So with all these probabilities, the way that the industry works through that is that we have a bunch of functional hazard assessments, which takes a functional look at the individual uh, functions that trace down throughout the system and look at all the points in which that function can be impacted. So if it moves through three or four systems, all the systems in the chain have to have some sort of way of preventing uh, failure conditions from occurring. So once we do that, uh, these probabilities are going to the functional DAL assignments. If you go take a look, here's where the standards start to come in. DO-178, DO-254, and DO-278 for ground systems operations. Uh, as well as ARP 4754 for uh, systems development. What those standards actually define is not how you develop a system. It is a very important piece here. The development objectives that you have to meet. So that means that you can't just go write code. You have to have requirements for the code. You have to have traceability down to the code itself. You have to have traceability to the actual compiled code. And then you actually have to test all that code. And it's defined in tables and uh, design objectives throughout these different, um, these different documents. Those design objectives that you work through are the deliverables that go to a regulatory body, 
in the US, that would be the FAA. Over in Europe, that would be EASA. If you have dual use between the two of them, it will be shared between the two of them. Those documents are the proof that you did the work. You have to prove that you did the operations and did the work. So as you have a higher DAO level, so DAO A would have the most stringent. What's unique about DAO A is that there is a required independence in the testing, which means the person who had de developed the system cannot be the one who has tested the system. It has to be a completely independent body that does the verification of your code or of your system, of your hardware, to ensure that there is independence between the developers and the test teams. <sighs> all right, so now you all are experts on safety. So now as we move forward, we start to talk about what uh, DO356A is. So DO356A defines the cybersecurity uh, development objectives for aircraft systems. One of the most important concepts in that is this concept of IUEI, which is intentional unauthorized electronic interactions. What it means is that someone has to be doing an attack intentionally. They did not have authorization for the system and it has to be electronic interactions. So no, birds flying, we know that they're not real. Birds flying into engines do not count, right? That's not intentional by the bird to do that. Um, so this is what makes security threats different from safety threats in our system development. But how we develop our systems around the two of them kind of start to touch. So safety is more of a kind of a, a what and why questions of how all these unintended adverse effects happen within uh, systems operation. Security looks at more of the who and where questions, right? We care more about who's doing it and uh, where they're, what systems they're touching because they should not have access to certain systems within uh, security boundaries and other places. Where the safety and security meet is in the how. How these events can happen so that we can mitigate those uh, the effects of those faults and the manipulation. All right, so 356 brings in a new concept of SAL. SAL is not directly tied to DAO, despite what a lot of people like to talk about with this. But what it is, is if you look at that table up top, table 4.4, which is taken directly out of uh, DO 356A, it gives you a threat condition effect severity, which kind of looks a lot like the advisory circulars with the definitions and gives you SAL levels for that mitigation. But what's unique here is that something that has an effect uh, condition of catastrophic, all of a sudden it has these two SAL levels, right? That's kind of weird. Why, why would you do two SAL levels? The big part about uh, security development is that we look at individual threat vectors as it moves through a system because we have to look at every point in which it could touch a system and have a final effect that may or may not have a safety effect on the uh, entire aircraft. So if we do have an effect on the entire aircraft, we have to go back through our safety analyses and we have to place mitigations, two of them in this case, of cell three and cell two in our system to prevent a catastrophic threat condition. So um, those mitigations have to be developed with security objectives, the design objectives for cell three and cell two. So if you're developing a system and if you look at the actual um, security assurance level uh, objectives, they look very, 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 very similar to exactly what DO-178 and DO-254, because all these documents are in concert with one another. They all feed from one another. They all use a lot of same concepts from one another. They all try to use the same uh, structures. So it makes it really easy for us to take our cybersecurity mitigations and place them into software or hardware and have the process look the same for development. All right, so we're gonna do a little bit of a uh, safety analysis on a system, right? So we have system A, we have system B, we have system C. 
And then we have a user display, right? It could be any sort of function here. So we do our functional hazardous assessment and it says that this system is, has a, a function that is dal b, okay? So we're looking at a path of, of dal b, uh, hazardously misleading data to a display. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply safety requirements onto this system. So we add in some monitors for failures and um, we'll enunciate those. We check the validity of the inputs. We check the uh, at system B and system C, right? System B is just gonna do a really simple operation of adding something on there. It could be either uh, changing data or manipulating data or um, merging data at some points. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a threat. We have an attack that modifies code or memory and changes that two to a four. That's pretty bad. Um, don't know how they managed to do that. But when we look at this system, there's erroneous data that's now flowing through the system, right? This is the hazard effect that we're looking at. We're looking at how the, uh, we can cause hazardously misleading data, Dalby impacts to the system. So fine, guess what? we're gonna hash the memory spaces so that none of that changes, right? We're gonna put hashes in place so that the values that we're adding or subtracting or uh, changing around the whole memory spaces are then hashed, right? And we'll get back to why I picked hashing in the first place. Safety analysis also said that there has to be a system B prime, which is a secondary thread to the system so that um, system uh, C merges data from both system B and system B prime kind of looks a lot like what we do for pilot side, co-pilot side in aircraft. Oh, there was another attack that our, our pen testing team came up with. They flooded the interface, they did a DDoS attack on our system C and it prevented data from going through to the user display. Crash the system. Well, I guess we need to go through and put together another mitigation so now we're gonna need some sort of DDoS protection, some sort of rate limiting in there. It's a pretty secure system so far. Oh, except they found a third attack, which is actually a mode command that's sent into systems, injected at system C, which then back propagates through the system to system A, which changes a mode, which then forces data to come out incorrectly without a pilot commanding a mode change. So you see how there's kind of a non-linearity through these systems where you could get these system effects without having exactly um, changed or manipulated or without having commanded uh, uh, commands be sent and get unintentional data that was not supposed to be there without some sort of other checks, right? So a lot of aircraft systems, it's not just that we press a button and the mode comes through. You press a button, it goes through, it sends back bits that says, yes, I saw that you changed the, command, uh, the mode, here's the new mode information. But what's unique about this is that that mode command may have also propagated back through the B prime and A prime systems through the secondary thread and has also uh, changed those modes, which gets around our cross-checking in system C. So now system, uh, so the, um, the primary thread and the secondary threads are now sending the same data, valid data across and it's not being picked up by system C. So what's interesting about this whole development here is that where safety and, and security really touch is some of the implementations that we actually have here. So you take a look at system B and we applied hashing memory. Our safety analysis also came back and said that B prime needed to be added as a safety mitigation on the system. But what does that do for the safe or security of the system, right? Now I have a secondary thread that I can cross check data against, an independent thread that somebody may not have access to that I can ensure that is part of the whole security um, posture of this whole entire system. So hashing memory is a great one, right? We use it in uh, cybersecurity in order to um, prevent manipulation, intentional manipulation of memory spaces. Well, over on the aerospace or on the safety side, they do that sort of stuff to prevent 
accidental manipulations from like, I don't know, uh, single event upsets from the sun, right? Neutron events on memory spaces. Um, other areas would be like duplicating or uh, triplicating data stored across the system. So that if you have manipulation in one place, you can go pick it up in another place. And if that one's still manipulated, you can go and pick it up somewhere else and cross check those three, uh, three different memory spaces. So safety and security have to kind of be developed together in these systems because you have these uh, concepts in here of inherited security principles or uh, properties of the system. Se 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 security is not the only developer of the system. Safety is doing it. Implementers of code are doing this. They're developing their own requirements with how they either think the system should work or how the system has been developed in the past and how other systems have been uh, have been developed. And so we have to take a look at not just security requirements, we have to look at the entire system requirements pool to see which items might be part of the safe, uh, security posture of the system. The reason why we want to do that is because we're gonna take credit for those in our threat models at some point. And if you take credit for them in your threat models, you have to provide the documentation as part of the design objectives. And if you have to provide data as part of your design objectives, it's part of your certification baseline and you want to take that credit for it. It all comes back down to the standards and the certification of these systems. Another important uh, piece in here is that you can also have system effects where safety and security may interact with each other in a negative manner where one may trigger you might want to you know trigger a safety event or a, you have an event that triggers some safety safeguards that have been in place and the security of the system is reduced because systems have now been reset and they lost state you might have security implementations in there where it prevents data from cross flowing from one side to another or um, you may have other pieces where data is unavailable because it's been encrypted that affects the safety of the system. So it's very important to look at how safety and security interplay in the requirements and determine like, is this a positive or a negative uh, part of our system? So um, in summary, aircraft cybersecurity is very young. DO-356, was first released in about in uh, 2014. In comparison to the advisory circular that I showed you at first, AC uh, 25, 1307, that was released in 88. We've had these, de these definitions around in, um, in aviation for almost 40 years. 40 years of development time to learn how to do all these development principles with how to develop safe or safe code, how to devise, uh, develop safe hardware has been going on for a very long time. But the security of these systems, because they're becoming more and more connected and um, even more highly connected in real time in the future, these systems need better security principles that work with how the systems are developed in order to provide certification boundaries. Pro to touch upon other technological limitations, prior systems in the past used to have federated systems where you had multiple single purpose systems on board which then moved into more highly integrated systems, which then moved into more highly uh, integrated networking systems as well. So those boundaries of um, data that you couldn't get security issues across because of the highly federated nature of these systems is now being whittled away at as part of the development because of the demands of higher speed buses. Airing 429 is not fast at all, but ethernet is and we can do that deterministically. The way that security um, brings those direct impacts has to be developed as part of the architecture because in the end, you can't have a safe system with also 
having a cyber secure system. Thank you.